505 years ago tomorrow, a Catholic priest named Martin Luther nailed 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. Those 95 theses, what that was, were 95 areas of dispute, disagreement, and debate that Martin Luther had with some of the practices of the Roman Catholic Church. You see, Luther had been spending time in the Bible, and the more time he spent there, the more he became convinced that many of the teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church contradicted or were not contained in Scripture. Luther became convinced that Scripture was the ultimate authority for the church rather than the church having ultimate authority over Scripture. So Luther's primary disagreements with the church were over the granting of indulgences and how that related to justification by faith and he rejected the church's belief in papal infallibility. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. Indulgences were offerings and gifts that people gave in order to speed up and lessen the time that their loved one would spend in purgatory. There was a saying in those days that said, every time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So the more coins and the more gifts that were given to the Catholic Church, the quicker your loved one could be sprung from purgatory. So the doctrine of papal infallibility is the belief that the Pope cannot err. He cannot make a mistake either in what he says or what he does. What he says is true even if it contradicts what a previous Pope has said. Not only that, but the Pope is not wrong even when he says things that contradict the Bible. Papal infallibility means that the Pope has a higher authority than Scripture and can even contradict and override it. And Martin Luther would have none of that. So if you have studied your Bible long enough, you already know that there is no mention of or teaching about purgatory in the Bible. It's a made-up doctrine for the convenience and the prosperity of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church runs on two primary cylinders, guilt and money. In the Catholic Church, you're always guilty. You can never do enough. There are so many rules, rituals, and regulations that it is difficult for anyone to clearly see how and know and understand what it means to truly be a Christian. But don't worry, they have a solution for that. If you just pay enough money and do whatever else they tell you to do, you can buy your way out of your predicament and eliminate your guilt for now. Of course, there will be more guilt to come that you will have to pay for. So Martin Luther began to see that these and other teachings ran contrary to scripture. So Luther was eventually placed on trial before the church and was ultimately asked to recant all that he had written in protest. Now, just on an aside, uh, that's where we get the word Protestant from, protestant, someone who protests. And that's kind of the, where this whole idea of a protestant re reformation came from. So Luther was asked to recant all that he had written in protest. And here's what he said. This is his response. He said, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. God help me. So Luther recovered the doctrine 
that scripture alone is sufficient for believers and the church. Luther did not intend to start a new group of churches known as Protestant churches. He wanted to reform the Catholic church by the word of God, but they wouldn't have it. They had a system that worked well for them, and there was no way that they were going to give up their power over people or their sway over nations. And so, as Luther's attempt to reform the church from within failed, and as people began to agree with Luther regarding the Bible and the church, a protest movement began that ultimately resulted in what we refer to today as the Protestant Reformation. And the very first of five doctrines that we refer to today as the five solas of the Reformation is the doctrine of scripture alone. In Latin, it's known as sola scriptura. Pastor John MacArthur said that the Reformation principle of sola scriptura has to do with the sufficiency of scripture as our supreme authority in all spiritual matters. Sola scriptura simply means that all truth necessary for our salvation and spiritual life is either taught explicitly or implicitly in scripture. And to further clarify this, Pastor Kevin DeYoung said, to affirm the sufficiency of scripture is not to suggest that the Bible tells us everything we want to know about everything but it does tell us everything we need to know about what matters most. Scripture does not give exhaustive information on every subject, but in every subject on which it speaks, it says only what is true. In its truth, we have enough knowledge to turn from sin, find the Savior, make good decisions, please God, and get to the root of our deepest problems. So what the Reformation was all about begins with the doctrine of sola scriptura, that scripture alone is infallible, authoritative, and sufficient for life and faith for believers individually and for the church congregationally. And for verses related to this, and there are a lot of different ones I could mention, but just for time's sake, I'll just mention a couple here. Uh, Matthew 4, verse 4, where Jesus responds to Satan's temptations, and he says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of, right, God. So, uh, Matthew 4, 4, Jesus um, quotes from the Old Testament, actually, from Deuteronomy, uh, what the Lord had, what the scripture said. And then uh, I would come into you Psalm 19. Now, Psalm 19 as a whole is wonderful. The first six verses deal with uh, the glory of God, the, the evidence of God's existence through nature, through creation, through his handiwork that's been put on display on earth and in the heavens. And then the rest of Psalm 19, starting in verse seven to the end, deals with what God's word does for us, the benefits that we get from knowing and learning and, and living God's word. And so uh, our main text this morning that um, I've not even read yet, which is unusual, but it's not a expository sermon this morning, um, but a, a topical one since we are dealing with the, this weekend, the, the whole topic of the Reformation. But I would just uh, have you turn to Ephesians 2 verses one through 10, which I think sort of encapsulates most of these five solas, if you will, of the Reformation and what the Reformation was all about. So in Ephesians 2, verses, verse, beginning in verse 1, it says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom 
Also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who was rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So that's the scripture, and it is the scripture alone that Luther appealed to as his authority, and that it should be the church's authority. And out of this doctrine of sola scriptura comes the doctrine of sola gratia, the doctrine of grace alone. The Reformation was also an attempt to recover the gospel that had been greatly obscured or purposefully twisted again in order to give the Catholic Church power and influence. If salvation includes the elimination of your guilt and you can do that by paying enough money and doing the right things, then salvation is not by grace alone but it's by works. And th that means there's something you can do to merit and earn salvation. And the Catholic Church was very happy to tell you what that was. And you certainly don't question them about this because uh, you'll put yourself in danger of being excommunicated and eternally damned. And that's one reason that they kept the Bible out of the language of the people because if the people read the Bible in their own language, they would realize that the Catholic Church had been duping them all these years. So the Bible is very clear that every man, woman, boy, and girl is a sinner. You're familiar with these verses in the Bible of Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, also in Romans 3, there is no one righteous, no, not one. And then from Isaiah 53, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, the Bible says. So in Ephesians 2 that we just read, Paul explains that people are spiritually dead because of sin. He says, you, uh, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. Uh, verse four, at the end of verse four, he says, when, uh, excuse, oh, no, verse five, the very beginning. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, or dead in trespasses. So, um, Paul explains here in Ephesians 2 that people are spiritually dead because of sin and are unable to respond to God's commands to repent and believe the gospel. In other words, left to ourselves, on our own, apart from God, we are like corpses that have no power or ability to do anything that will spiritually avail for us. That's why God must take the initiative in salvation. That's why Paul writes that God, because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Alive together with Christ and he raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, there's some things written in this passage in Ephesians 2 that, that I don't fully understand. But what I do understand is that the reason I'm a Christian today is because when I was nine years old, God quickened me. He awakened me spiritually. He worked in me in such a way that caused me to see and understand my predicament because of my sin. And I realized my need for Jesus. I needed a savior. 
And before that happened to me, I saw no need for Jesus. But praise be to God that his spirit convicted me of sin, judgment, and righteousness and enabled me to see my need for Christ and trust in him. So when I was nine, I didn't understand all of this like I do now, looking back on it and having years of experience studying and reading the word. But what I did know back then, very simply, when I, uh, is that I needed to be saved. So I trusted in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That was all of God. Left to myself, that wouldn't have happened. It was his spirit's work in my heart, on my life. And I know that he has done that in the lives of many of you here today. I am sure that many of you can think back about a time in your life when you weren't thinking about the things of God. You weren't thinking about eternity, sin, death, heaven, or hell. Those weren't even on your radar. And for, but, and, and, and for some of you, you can't really explain what happened to you other than it's like a light switch just came on in your mind. There was a time when you didn't get all this talk about Jesus. You thought it was foolish. This religion, this Christian stuff is for weak people who need a crutch. But then the light came on and you saw yourself for who you were, a sinner in need of a savior, and that Jesus would save you if you would just call upon him. And before that, you saw no need for Jesus, the Bible, the church, or any of that stuff. But God, like Paul writes here in Ephesians 2, who was rich in mercy, made you alive, and today you're saved. Praise God. It's all by the grace of God. It's by his grace alone that any of us are saved. None of us deserve it. In fact, we all deserve hell. But God in his grace reached down to us and called us to himself by his spirit. Salvation is all the work of God. It is the, it's by grace alone. And that's what the doctrine of sola gratia is all about. Ephesians 2.8 is very clear. It speaks right to it. It says that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We're saved by grace alone, not works. This comes from hearing the word of God. In fact, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's just God's word is powerful. The spirit uses it to, to awaken us. In fact, uh, if you're still in Ephesians, look back at the, in chapter one, look at verse 13. It says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. After you heard it, you trusted in Christ. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So after you heard the word and you believed the gospel, you were saved and you were sealed in your salvation by the Holy Spirit. So God awakens us spiritually and he draws us to himself by grace alone. But now we move to the next sola of the Reformation. We respond to his work of grace in our lives by faith alone. The spirit who draws us to Christ also at the same, times, uh, same time gives us faith to savingly believe in him. That's what the Bible teaches, that we're saved by grace alone. You can see it, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through what? Faith. Through faith. Grace alone through faith alone. Sola fide. Faith alone. The, that's the third thing that the Reformation was all about. Faith alone. Now, again, the Catholic Church purposefully kept the Bible 
hidden and inaccessible to the average person and basically told them that if they just go along with what we tell you is true and do what we tell you to do, we're going to make sure you're safe. In other words, if you trust the teaching of the church, you will be safe. But that's not true. The Bible says that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we're going to talk about Christ alone next. But it doesn't come by trusting in the teachings, the official teachings of the church. It's not about religion it, it's about a relationship. It's about knowing the Savior. It's not knowing about Him or doctrine or anything. Even though those things are important, that's not what saves you. What saves you is Jesus Himself, faith alone in Christ alone. You see, if righteousness comes by faith alone and not by all the other things the Catholic Church was adding to it, that will bring an end to the priest-operated, church-based, works-driven system of salvation, and a Christ-centered, faith-based Christianity would result. And as Paul and James both remind us, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was made right with God by faith alone. He simply trusted in the Lord. Martin, here, here's another quote from Martin Luther. Luther said, you will never find true peace until you find it and keep it in this, that Christ takes all your sin upon himself and bestows all his righteousness upon you. Isn't that great? That's the gospel. So, all right, so far we've seen that scripture alone tells us that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Christ alone, or the, again, the Latin term for that is solus Christus, means no person or sacrament can provide humanity with salvation except Jesus. It is Christ alone who saves. No right ritual or religious activity can save you. And to be saved requires simple faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ plus nothing. The Catholic Church teaches that there is a mediatorial role for the church to play with respect to a person's salvation. They teach that a person receives all the blessings of salvation won by Jesus on the cross through observing the sacraments and particularly attending and participating in mass. Such things add extra unbiblical activities to salvation and imply that the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was not enough. Something needs to be added to what Jesus did in order to make it sufficient enough. And this additional activity insisted upon by the Catholic Church is insulting to the clear teaching of Scripture. And if true, there are a lot of hymns we would need to rewrite the words to. And the one that comes to mind right now for me is Jesus Paid It All. You know that song, you know the hymn. I'm gonna, let me just sing. Here, here's what you would have to sing if what the Catholic Church teaches about uh, Christ uh, not being enough. Here, here's, what, here's how you would have to sing it. Jesus paid it some and to church I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain Jesus plus my obedience to the works required by the Catholic Church washed it white as snow. It's funny how when you change it up like that, it almost sounds like a, a Catholic chant. But <laughs> anyway, so the doctrine of solus Christus, Christ alone, is a fourth reason for the Reformation. All right, the fifth and final 
reason for the Reformation is the biblical culmination of everything we've discussed so far. God gave us a book that's infallible, inspired, authoritative, and sufficient for faith and life. Scripture alone teaches that humanity has sought to be its own God, go its own way, call its own shots, run its own show, determine right and wrong, good and bad, morality, ethics, and everything else based upon its own relativistic standards that change so much, so fast, that it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. And as Dr. Phil often asks, how's that working for you? Well, it's not working for us. Our country and this world are in a mess, amen? Yeah, and it seems like things are getting worse every day. However, the Bible reveals God's standard. He knows how he's designed us, and he knows for what he has designed us, what will make us thrive, what is for our good, and we need to turn back to God and his word and his ways through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? He has been calling people back to himself for centuries. He's calling people back to himself today in all the churches that are preaching the gospel throughout our land and across the world. He's calling people back to himself. Maybe you're one of those who's sensing God's spirit working on you right now to cause you to see your need for Jesus and the salvation that he offers. It's yours today by grace alone. There's nothing you can do to earn, deserve, or merit it. Just receive it, and it can be yours today by faith alone. Simply trust, surrender, and yield to Jesus, and you will be saved. You don't need to do anything more. And, and salvation can be yours today only if you trust in Christ alone, Jesus plus nothing. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. That's the way you sing Jesus paid it all. So, all of God's work, from God's word, to God's grace, to the gift of faith, to his son Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection for all who believe, is all to the glory of God. And that's the fifth and final sola that I want to talk about as we close this morning. All to the glory of God, soli Deo Gloria. God gets the glory for it all. He gets the glory in our salvation. He gets the glory in our service to him because it's not I but Christ in me. He gets the glory in our sanctification, our being made more like Christ. He must increase and I must decrease. And he will get the glory in our glorification, which will occur either when we go to be with him at death or if we're still around when the trumpet blows and the archangel shouts, he will come and receive us unto himself and we will go to be with the Lord forever. So everything, our salvation from start to finish, the good work he began in us, he will complete it. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Everything he does is to the praise of his glory, all to the glory of God. As it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen? Amen. So I hope that you have found this message instructive and encouraging and and if you want to know more about these things, please reach out to me. My contact information is on the front of the bulletin. Our website is listed there. Our Facebook page is listed there. Um, 
If you watch this sermon later online on YouTube or through the link at Facebook, um, contact me through the comment section. You can leave a comment or send a message or whatever, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. And so we're going to close uh, the service with a hymn written by Martin Luther. A mighty fortress is our God. And it's based upon Psalm 46 that we read earlier in the service. And so let's stand and sing all four verses. And after that, we will partake of the Lord's Supper.